Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Silver Chair by C.S. Lewis. So this is Chronicles of Narnia, book number six of seven, if you read them in, like, chronological order rather than publication order. This is just the order that the box set that I got them came in. So yeah, I enjoyed this one. I've put some tabs in it that I'm going to go through in a second as well. I want to read the blurb first. A prince imprisoned, a country in peril. Through dangers untold and caverns deep and dark, a noble band of friends are sent to rescue a prince held captive. But their mission to Wonderland brings them face to face with an evil more beautiful and more deadly than they ever expected. And this one no longer has any of the original four kids from The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe in. Although we do have Eustace, who is in the last book, uh, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And he was in that with, uh, I want to say it was Lucy and Edmund. Yeah, the two younger ones. So he's back in this. And then we have a new character called Jill as well. It says here... Uh, Oh, law, said the boy, sitting down on the grassy bank at the edge of the shrubbery and very quickly getting up again because the grass was soaking wet. His name, unfortunately, was Eustace Scrub, but he wasn't a bad sort. He's definitely a bad sort. He's a little dick. There's this little exchange with Jill. He says, I'll tell you about that another time, and he might like us to face the east. Let's see, where is the east? I don't know, said Jill. It's an extraordinary thing about girls that they never know the points of the compass, said Eustace. I don't think it's really that. She, she, she knows North, East, South, West. She's just not a compass. Uh, and then uh, Jill bursts into tears. It says, crying is all right in its way while it lasts, but you have to stop sooner or later, and then you still have to decide what to do. Which is almost kind of poetic in a way. So Jill meets Aslan, and uh, so she basically, she wanted to go and get some water from a stream, but she saw a lion and was like, hmm, maybe not then. It says... It lay with its head raised and its two forepaws out in front of it, like the lions in Trafalgar Square. And I have seen the lions in Trafalgar Square, so that's quite cool. I like as well, so she asks him, do you eat girls? I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. Humble as always, Aslan. Then there's this dwarf as well, and we get a bit of, you know, the uh, four candles run to Ronnie sketch. You know, handles for forks. No, no, four candles. Uh, that kind of happens here. The girls called Jill, said the owl, as loud as it could. What's that? said the dwarf. The girls are all killed. I don't believe a word of it. What's that? said the dwarf. The girls are all killed. I don't believe a word of it. What girls? Who killed them? Only one girl, my lord, said the owl. Her name is Jill. Speak up, speak up, said the dwarf. Don't stand there buzzing and twittering in my ear. Who's been killed? Nobody's been killed, hooted the owl. Who? Nobody. All right, all right, you needn't shout. I'm not so deaf as all that. What do you mean by coming here to tell me that nobody's been killed? Why should anyone have been killed? Better tell him I'm Eustace, said Scrub. The boy's Eustace, my lord, hooted the owl as loud as it could. Useless, said the dwarf irritably. I dare say he is. Is there any reason for bringing him to court, hey? And then the dwarf says, son of Adam and daughter of Eve, hey? But people at Experiment House, which is where they were schooled, haven't heard of Adam and Eve, so Jill and Eustace couldn't answer this. Again, I refuse to believe that they would never have heard of Adam and Eve. It's just one of those, like, common knowledge things. But then Eustace also hadn't heard of dragons. So, I mean, I guess he's literally been raised under a rock. I don't know. And then, and then Eustace tries to explain the weird time laws of Narnia that still don't really make sense to me. Oh, dry up. Don't keep interrupting. And when you're back in England, in our world, you can't tell how time is going here. It might be any number of years in Narnia while we're having one year at home. The Pevensies explained it all to me, but like a fool, I forgot about it. And now apparently it's been about 70 years, Narnian years. Since I was here last. Do you see now? I almost feel as though this sort of weird time dilation is just used as an excuse to add backstory and to move the story on for like 70 odd years or whatever. Because uh, it's just not very well thought out or consistent. Anyway, uh, then we have this. We, we, have, we have this little reference to the horse and his boy. My least favourite book in the series so far. And when all the serious eating and drinking was over, a blind poet came forward and struck up the grand old tale of Prince Cor and Aravis and the horse Bree, which is called the horse and his boy and tells of an adventure that happened in Narnia and Calaman and the lands between in the golden age when Peter was hiking in Caer Paravel. I haven't time to tell it now, though it is well worth hearing. It's not. It's so far, it's the only one of these, like, I would say unless you're a completionist and you really want to read the whole series, series just skip that one. It's, it was garbage. And then the owls are having a parliament when they're all meeting. And um, Eustace wants to know why they're meeting at night and if, unless they're up to no good. And it's like, mate, they're owls. They're nocturnal. We wouldn't ask anyone else, like a, a regular person or whatever, why they were having a meeting in the day. I, think, I find this line quite humorous as well. 
But they were busy in vain, for at the first glance of her face, Rillian knew that no phys- Oh, physic. I thought it said psychic in the world would do her good. I was going to say, no psychic in the world is going to do you any good. Uh, and then we discover that there's this character who has a scheme. And um, the oldest owl says, it means she has some use for him and some deep scheme against Narnia. Long ago, at the very beginning, a white witch came out of the north and bound our land in snow and ice for a hundred years. And we think this may be some of the same crew. So that would be the witch from The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. But interestingly, if that's the very beginning, that means there was nothing in, like, no history to Narnia before the witch showed up. There's also a mention here of, like, there's this, like, curious property of the Narnian air. So if you stay in Narnia for a few years and then go away and come back, within a couple of days you'll have, like, your old fitness levels and physique and skills and all of that will have all come back to you. So that's starting to happen to Eustace, even though he was useless. I like how pedantic this, ca this character called Puddle Glum is as well. We've got to start by finding a ruined city of giants, said Jill. Aslan said so. Got to start by finding it, have we? Answered Puddleglum. Not allowed to start by looking for it, I suppose. He makes a good point. And then I have a meal of eels. After the meal, they had tin... After the meal, they had tea in tins, as you've seen men having it who are working on the road. And this is one of my pet hates in books in general, when the, when the writer directly addresses the reader like that. But also, I've never seen a workman drinking tea out of a tin like i don't know if it's different in the uk in the us but c.s lewis was from the uk and a tin is like when you get like tinned food like i think americans call it canned food i've never heard of tea in a tin and presumably it'd be cold unless they make their tea separately like i don't know if you see workmen today they're not drinking tea out of tins they're drinking it out of starbucks cups aren't they uh here's here's a little bit where puddle glum sounds like my other half all three went to bed early in the wigwam this time the children really had a rather bad night. That was because Puddleglum, after saying, you better try for some sleep, you two, not that I suppose any of us will close an eye tonight, instantly went off into such a loud continuous snore that when Jill at last got to sleep, she dreamed all night about road drills and waterfalls and being in express trains and tunnels. And then we have this little bit here. That night they bivouacked on the bare moor and Puddleglum showed the children how to make the best of their blankets by sleeping back to back. I love the word bivouacked, although I did have to look it up for like an ex exact definition. So a temporary camp without tents or cover. So that's not really a camp. That's just lying down wherever you end up. Like, am I wrong? I don't know. I don't know. The kids are directed to go and see these giants and they're told to, to tell them that she of the green kirtle salutes them by you and has sent them two fair southern children for the autumn feast. And the kids are getting very excited because they're going to get to eat. And just as a reader, you know, when they say for the autumn feast, they mean they're going to eat them. And so here, here we have the moment when they, when they actually get there. If you please, sire, the lady of the green kirtle salutes you by us and said you'd like to have us for your autumn feast. The giant king and queen looked at each other, nodded to each other and smiled in a way that Jill didn't exactly like. She liked the king better than the queen. He had a fine curled beard and a straight eagle-like nose and was really rather good looking as giants go. The queen was dreadfully fat and had a double chin and a fat powdered face, which isn't a very nice thing at the best of times and of course looks much worse when it is ten times too big. Then the king put out his tongue and licked his lips. Anyone might do that, but his tongue was so very large and red and came out so unexpectedly that it gave Jill quite a shock. And then it did that thing where the author directly addresses the reader and that always tends to annoy me so here it goes. I hope you won't lose all interest in Jill for the rest of the book if I tell you that at this moment she began to cry. There was a good deal of excuse for her. Her feet and hands and ears and nose were still only just beginning to thaw. Melted snow was trickling off her clothes. She had had hardly anything to eat or drink that day and her legs were aching so that she felt she could not go on standing much longer. Anyway, it did more good at the moment than anything else would have done. We get this little quote as well. Uh, the meal, which I suppose we must call dinner, though it was nearer tea time, was cock leaky soup and hot roast turkey and a steamed pudding and roast chestnuts and as much fruit as you could eat. So what's the difference between dinner and tea time? Because at least where I grew up in the Midlands, we use those kind of interchangeably. Okay, then we get to where it starts to get a bit weird. Now the meanings of these words have changed. And I knew this one, I knew that gay obviously used to mean like happy and you know, almost free spirited and now means homosexual. But I didn't realize that make love used to mean like to court or woo and now means to have sex with. 
I've just only ever read it as to have sex with. So it got really weird because this is about a sm like a young girl in this. And it turns out that Ag Agatha Christie used to do the same thing in her books. And every time I've read it in her books, I've just assumed that it actually meant to have sex with when it didn't. Even though, like, by the, so the usage kind of changed around the 1940s, and this was published in 1953. So he would have been aware that the usage had changed. Puddleglum says this, Gay, that's what we've got to be, gay. As if we hadn't got a care in the world. And frolicsome. Right, which is all fine. And then we have Jill. Jill has gone off on a tour of the castle. She made love to everyone, the grooms, the porters, the housemaids, the ladies in waiting, and the elderly giant lords whose hunting days were past. She submitted to being kissed and poured about by any number of giantesses, gay, many of whom seemed sorry for her and called her a poor little thing, though none of them explained why. I don't know, it just seems a bit odd reading that about a girl who's like 14, kind of threw me a little bit, until I realised that there was another meaning to making love. Uh, then Aslan shows up and we get this. Uh, it was a dark, flat voice. Almost, if you know what that means. A pitch black voice. I don't know what that means. I think the only way you could know what that meant would be if you had synesthesia. Then we get Jill. She says, where I come from, they don't think much of men who are bossed about by their wives. I don't think they should be judging people where you come from, Jill. Maybe they like to be bossed about. And then... And then Jill also says of someone else, he never offered us a wash before supper, selfish, self-centered pig. I have never been offered a wash before supper, and I've never offered a wash before supper. Although I don't have supper, to be fair. But does that make, like, that surely makes everybody that I know a selfish, self-centered prig. And then we have a witch, because uh, basically, that because they've gone off on this mission to try and rescue the king's son, He's been enchanted by a witch, and then the witch is, like, enchanting them to forget that Narnia is a place, and it, it doesn't work, long story short. And then Jill calls Eustace, Eustace, and it says, and this was the first time they had ever used Christian names, because one didn't do it at school. Again, this is from another time, because we never used surnames at school, it was, just, you just used first names. Use surnames for teachers, like Mr. Briggs or whatever. Not one of my teachers, just an example. I love this as well. I think is it this is a what is he a gnome? Yeah, he is a gnome, and he doesn't he 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 says uh, that was the worst thing the witch did to us. We were going to be led out into the open, onto outside of the world. They say there's no roof out there, only a horrible great emptiness called the sky. Yeah, I know that feeling. I think us introverts can relate. And Golg says if they go down instead, go underground with him. He says. I've heard of those little scratches in the crust that you top dwellers call mines, but that's where you get dead gold, dead silver, dead gems. Down in Bism we have them alive and growing. There I'll pick you bunches of rubies that you can eat and squeeze you a cup full of diamond juice. You won't care much about fingering the cold dead treasures of your shallow mines after you have tasted the live ones of Bism. Oh yeah, and then so they get back and the prince is wearied and it says, but I think they would have known him anyway. Pale though he was from long imprisonment in the deep lands, dressed in black, dusty, dishevelled and weary, there was something in his face and air which no one could mistake. That look is in the face of all true kings of Narnia, who rule by the will of Aslan and sit at Caer Paravel on the throne of Peter the High King. I don't agree with this idea that you can recognise royalty from the way they look. Unless it's like some sort of inbred joke, because that tends to be what happens historically with royal families. And then we get a little bit of confirmation that this witch is doubtless the same kind as that white witch who had brought the great winter on Narnia long ago, who is the one from the line The Witch in the Wardrobe. Here we have another one of his unnecessary digs against vegetarianism or indeed veganism. So they're talking, the dwarves are making sausages and he says, And not wretched sausages, half full of bread and soya bean either, but real meaty spicy ones, fat and piping hot and burst and just the tiniest bit burnt. Mmm, cooked animal flesh. And then we have this weird little bit, so we're talking about centaurs. Why, son of Adam, don't you understand? A centaur has a man's stomach and a horse stomach, and of course both want breakfast. So first of all he has porridge and pavenders and kidneys and bacon and omelette and cold ham and toast and marmalade and coffee and beer. And after that he attends to the horse part of himself by grazing for an hour or so and finishing up with a hot mash, some oats and a bag of sugar. That's why it's such a serious thing to ask a centaur to stay for the weekend. So, who has beer for breakfast? I mean, I have been known to do that at music festivals. <laughs> but it's not like a default part of breakfast. And that seems like a bad thing to be telling kids as well. Uh, then we get Eustace. Um, 
Aslan says to him, Son of Adam, go into that thicket and pluck the thorn that you will find there and bring it to me. Drive it into my poor son of Adam. Which he does. But uh, I'm pretty sure that's a biblical reference. There's definitely a tale anyway. I, I believe it is of a Christian who was in who was like put against the lions in the gladiators and he pulled the thorn from the lion's paw and then the lion spared him or something. Uh, and then the king dies and then gets brought back to life again. <laughs> and then Eustace says, but, 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 said Eustace, looking at Aslan, hasn't he uh, died? Yes, said the lion in a very quiet voice. Almost, Jill thought, as if he were laughing. He has died. Most people have, you know, even I have. There are very few who haven't. Uh, and then we get one of his digs at the education industry as well. So, um... Uh, basically, about ten people got expelled. After that, the head's friends saw that the head was no use as a head, so they got her made an inspector to interfere with other heads. And when they found she wasn't much good even at that, they got her into Parliament where she lived happily ever after. So yeah, there was there were some bits in this that I did like, but I also thought it dragged quite a bit as well. It didn't have quite the same excitement levels as some of the previous books, and there were some bits where it was downright, downright weird. Um, yeah, I just found it harder to get into the story, so I gave it a 3.25 out of 5, but it wasn't terrible, it certainly wasn't as bad as The Horse and His Boy, but it also wasn't as good as The Magician's Nephew or uh, Prince Caspian. So yeah, that's what, that's what I made of it. So there we have it, as always, thanks a lot for watching, don't forget to let me know what you thought of this book in the comments if you've read it, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video, thanks a lot, Bye bye